Now time for question period. The Leader of Her Majesty's Royal Opposition. Thank you, Speaker. Thank you, Speaker. Uh, question uh, for the Premier. Uh, Premier, the current law requires you to produce a detailed financial report about the province's books before an election campaign. Finances, expenses, the debt, growth projections. Um, but there's a, a loophole in that law that, as it's written, in a minority situation, so if there's an election next quarter, that, that report would not come before the taxpayers of the province of Ontario. Um, Premier, you said you want to be open and transparent. I don't think you meant that ironically. Um, so will you be good to your word and actually support closing Fair that loophole? Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. And, uh, I love it when the opposition has an epiphany, Mr. Speaker. In 2003, uh, we introduced the Financial Transpar Transparency and Accountability Act, um, the, one of the first pieces of legislation that we introduced, Mr. Speaker. And as it happens, the Conservatives voted against that. Mr. Speaker. So we absolutely, we absolutely believe that it's important that people have the information uh, as we go into an election. We put that in place, Mr. Speaker, to address a $5.6 billion deficit that had not been revealed before the election, Mr. Speaker. So we believe that it was very necessary that we have that piece of legislation in place. And I have said repeatedly since that day forward that we are committed to that kind of openness and transparency, Mr. Speaker. So we're very glad that the uh, Leader of the op Opposition has seen the light on this, Mr. Speaker. Well, um, I guess that's the answer I expected. Uh, I was hoping for a clear yes, though, Premier. Uh, you know, I, I, I hope that you're not wiggling here. I no, we're, we're going to start right off the bat. Stop. I'll go into individual writings now. Leader? I, I hope you're not trying to wiggle off the hook here with some, some misdirection. I hope you can give me a straight-up answer um, on this. So basically, this would be a financial report that the Auditor General would sign off on. So during an election campaign, potentially in the spring, that taxpayers would know the true state of the book signed up by the Auditor General. When you crafted your legislation, you uh, cleverly left in a loophole that gets you off the hook. Uh, I want to commend the member for Halliburton, Fourth Lakes, Brock, and Lori Scott, um, who's, um, who's caught you on this, and she's brought forth a question. first bill that we debated on Thursday. So my very simple question to you, Premier, is, Will you and the Liberal caucus support Lori Scott's bill and close the Liberal loophole? Thank you. Can you say it, please? Can you say it, please? Thank you. Premier? Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Well, we have, we have said all along, Mr. Speaker, that we'll continue to look for new and, uh, and important ways to provide more transparency and openness. With as with all private members' bills, Mr. Speaker, we'll look at the, listen to the debate. I haven't seen the legislation. I don't know exactly what it encompasses. I look forward to the debate. But, Mr. Speaker, I would just ask the leader of the opposition to remember that it was our government that introduced the legislation in the first place. We we brought in the legislation because there was a 5.6 billion dollar deficit that had been hidden from the people of Ontario when we came into office in 2003. So, of course, Mr. Speaker, we're going to look for new ways. We're happy happy to have passed legislation on the, uh, to bring in the Financial Accountability Officer, Mr. Speaker. We're the first Answer. provincial government in Ontario to have that oversight measure. Of course, we'll be looking for new ways to be transparent. Look forward to the debate on the private member's bill. Final supplementary. <laughs> well, the Premier, it's pretty straightforward. If you're looking for uh, new ways to ensure transparency, it's, it's kind of staring you right in the face, two desks behind you, and Lori Scott's bill. <laughs> she, she brought it forward. She would, she would close a liberal loophole, and she would compel the finance minister then to put the true state of the books before the province in a election campaign, and the auditor general would sign off on it. I mean, what, what's wrong with that? I don't understand why you're resisting closing the liberal loophole here. Um, you, you know, Premier, that uh, when Don Drummond looked at your books, uh, he discovered that you're actually heading towards a $30 billion deficit that you're taking the province to tripling our provincial debt. So we don't really believe, we're gonna take with us a few grains of salt what the finance minister says. Question. We actually want to see the auditor general sign off on the books before a spring election campaign. Will you close the loophole, yeah. do the right thing. You see it, please? You see it, please? Thank you, Premier. The Auditor General discovered that we're the only government that has, in fact, reduced spending year over year, Mr. Speaker. We have Forward. I'm happy to listen to the debate, Mr. Speaker. As I 
said, we haven't seen the details. We haven't looked at what the uh, what the legislation actually what the implications would be. But we introduced the legislation in the first place, Mr. Speaker. We said that it was important that before an election, people in the province know what is in the province's books, and we did that, Mr. Speaker, because there was a 5.6 billion dollar deficit that had been hidden before the previous uh, when the previous government was in office before the 2003 election, Mr. Speaker. We said that shouldn't happen again. So of course we're willing Answer. to look at the private members bill. We look forward to the debate and uh, I'm glad that the uh, I'm glad that the leader of the opposition finally sees that this is an, an important path to be on. Be seated please. Be seated please. New question, leader of the uh, opposition. Uh, back to the, uh, the Premier, Speaker. I'm not sure why the Premier is dancing around and avoiding uh, answering a simple yes or no question. Uh, she says that maybe she's not been briefed on the bill. If you, if you are, uh, we hope we get an answer uh, as soon as possible. Because clearly, I, I don't know how anybody can argue with this. It closes a Liberal loophole. It would force the Finance Minister to put the true state of the books before the province and sign off of the Auditor General. It seems very straightforward. I don't know why they're resisting on this, Mr. Speaker. Well, maybe I have one idea, I guess. Your economic statement that you put out two weeks ago, as Vic Fidelli pointed out in his Fidelli Focus on Finance, your medium-term outlook numbers uh, are absent. You, you don't actually show how you get to a balanced budget. You know, this stuff is actually pleasure reading for me, Speaker. I, I actually enjoy reading these reports. Question. But those totally blank the pages that show what you're going to do for spending in the medium term. You rip those pages out. It's like saying the ending of a story and ripping out all the chapters. So why are Thank you providing you. information? What are you keeping from the public? Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. So, as I've said, we're looking forward to the debate on the private member's bill, Mr. Speaker. Unlike the Leader of the Opposition, who will vote against a budget before he has read it, Mr. Speaker, I am not going to commit to voting for legislation before I have read it and before I have heard the debate, Mr. Speaker. I believe that this place works best when we have the opportunity to hear people's perspectives and to hear what the implications of a particular piece of legislation would be, just as I believe that it's important to read a budget before you decide whether you're going to vote against it or not. So we're going to read the legislation. We're going to listen to the debate, Mr. Speaker. We're going to look at the implications, but I would just say that we brought in legislation in order to deal with the issues around transparency. Yes, we did that when we were first elected because of a deficit that had been hidden, Mr. Speaker. We are consistently looking for new ways to be transparent, and we look forward to Thank the you. debate on this private member's bill. Supplementary. Well, respectfully, uh, Premier, this legislation was tabled two weeks ago. Uh, I would fully expect that uh, you've been briefed on it. Your, your finance minister surely is aware of this bill, and I imagine it's got to be 100 percent supportive. I don't see how you can argue with it. And if you do agree with Laurie Scott's bill, because we are 100 percent behind that bill to close the Liberal loophole. I'd ask you also then to produce what's missing for the financial economic statement. It, it puzzles me what you're trying to hide. I mean, I, I, my background's in economics. Um, that's what gives me this scintillating personality and charming sense of humor. But I actually do read these things. And imagine my disappointment when that outlook was missing from your financial economic statement. It makes me wonder, uh, number one, is the deficit even worse Question. than you say? Are you going to raise taxes, number two? And does this mean you have no clue whatsoever how to get into the hole that you've dug us in? Put those papers Thank you, Premier. Mr. Speaker, I find it passing strange that the member opposite and all of his friends there are talking about transparency and accountability. Transparency and accountability that this government has brought to this House well before they decided to flirt with the idea. In fact, Mr. Speaker, if they read the budget from pages 143 to 148, we spoke at length about the new measures of accountability, including post-secondary education, child welfare, community-based mental health, consumer agencies, the tax credit system, and, of course, the introduction of a, of a financial accountability officer, which would have the powers well beyond that being brought forward by the private member's bill. They 
Sir voted against those very measures, and now they decide that they want to come forward with amendments to a measure that they never even even read, Mr. Speaker. We will continue to do our part to bring that transparency and accountability to this House. Thank you. Final supplementary. The, 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 finance, the finance minister says that uh, there's a new level of transparency. Well, I look forward to seeing what the OPP has to say after they investigate your office for the, the gas man scandal. I mean, come on, not one, but two OPP investigations. That takes some doing. But I, I'll ask the finance minister, because I know he's been briefed on this. I know he's on top of his files. It was tabled two weeks ago. And I know someday soon he's going to be moving beyond talking points and actually proving that he's got this file under control. So I'll ask him, if I don't get an answer for the Premier, will you agree to Laurie Scott's bill? Will you close the Liberal loophole? Will you put before the people of Ontario the true state of the finances signed off by the Auditor General in time for a spring election campaign? Yes, sir. I, uh, I don't ask for quiet so that it can ramp back up again. Carry on, please. Mr. Speaker, the province of Ontario, this government, is the first government and the first province in Canada to introduce a financial accountability officer to maintain integrity in our numbers. We introduced, we introduced interim reports illustrating that we cut spending even again last quarter. The Auditor General has audited our books, and it showed that the province of Ontario took determined and disciplined measures to reduce spending as well as control of spending for the last four years running. We recognize the challenges before us, Mr. Speaker. We recognize that the, 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 the world market has Hastings. continued to, to slow, and yet Ontario has consistently exceeded its targets because of the measures and the directions that we have taken. We'll continue to do that. We'll continue to do what's necessary for the benefit of Ontarians and for growing our economy. And I say to the member opposite, who stood in this House in 2003 before the $5.6 billion hidden deficit, he said this, and I quote, the provincial budget had— You're not going to get to say it. No question. The leader of the third party. Thank you. Sit up. Sit up. Thank you, Speaker. Thank you, Speaker. My question is for the Premier. Over three years ago, New Democrats proposed targeted tax credits to reward companies when they put people to work in the province of Ontario. Now, thousands of jobs, lo job losses later, uh, the government has committed to studying the idea. How many more jobs will be lost while the government does that, Speaker? Premier. Tax credits. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Well, I think the, uh, the leader of the third party knows that, uh, that we are putting in place measures that, uh, that will invest in people and will invest in infrastructure and will create an environment that uh, will allow businesses to thrive. So, Mr. Speaker, we have said there, is a, a, there are, are a series of, uh, of tax credits in place that have supported business, and we need to look at those. We need to make sure that uh, the business tax credits that are in place are working, Mr. Speaker, and that they are having Having the, they're having the desired effect, Mr. Speaker, and so making sure that we look at those. Uh, you know, I think that uh, the notion that somehow, uh, the notion that somehow there shouldn't be those kinds of supports in place Answer. does not make sense, Mr. Speaker. And so we're looking at them to make sure that the ones that are there are actually having the desired effect of creating jobs. Good supplementary. Speaker, um, before the last budget, the government also said they would take action to close new corporate tax loopholes uh, that will hand Ontario's biggest businesses a tax break, not when they create jobs, mind you, but when they wine and dine clients or buy box seats at the Sky Dome. Has the government closed that loophole, Speaker? So, uh, I know that the Minister of Finance has, uh, has spoken to this a number of times and is working with the federal government on some of the specifics, Mr. Speaker, but I think the, you know, the bottom line is that we need to make sure that we have the right supports in place for business, including the, uh, the supports that would uh, help small business with their payroll tax, Mr. Speaker, which is why we want to get the Small Business Act passed. 
because we want to make sure that the, the right supports are there so that businesses can expand, Mr. Speaker, and at the same time, make sure that we put the supports for young people in place. And it's, you know, it's very heartening that the, uh, the post-secondary institutions today are going to be talking to members about what they are doing to work with young people and make sure that the supports and the programs that are in place in the colleges and universities are preparing young people for the jobs that are available, because we know we've got jobs and we know that we've got young people who are looking for those jobs. We Thank need you. to make sure that those are linked together, Mr. Thank Speaker. You. Final supplementary. Well, Speaker, what the Premier may not realize is that for people losing jobs, this is pretty concerning stuff. The Liberal government plows forward with an HST giveaway that rewards companies for hitting the town. But for some reason, the Premier seems to think she needs to hold more conversation and more consultation be before she moves forward with proven tools that have helped provinces like Manitoba become the shining star of Canada's recovery. Can the Premier explain why proven tax measures go to the back of the line, while tax measures that help well-connected insiders and cost Ontarians, Ontarians billions and billions of dollars are the Premier's top priority? Premier. So thank you very much, Mr. Speaker, and maybe in that in that exchange, the leader of the third party would explain why she's not going to work with us to get the Small Businesses Act passed, Mr. Speaker, because that that will actually help small businesses with their payroll taxes, and it would actually help 60,000 uh, small businesses in Ontario, Mr. Speaker. So I hope that when the uh, the leader of the third party talks about targeted tax measures, Mr. Speaker, that she would work with us on that one, because I agree with her, Mr. Speaker, that we need to work with the federal government on some of the issues that the, the Minister of Finance has raised and has, is in conversation with the federal government. But there are issues before this House, Mr. Speaker, like the Small Businesses Act, on which we could use the support of the NDP and make sure that that gets passed and we give those supports to our small businesses in the province, Mr. Thank Speaker. You. New question, leader of the third party. Liberals should stop playing political game, Speaker, and things would move forward a lot more cleanly. My next question, Speaker, is to the Premier. In communities across Ontario, people who rely on gaming to provide good jobs are wondering what the government's plan is doing to their industry. Last year, the government plowed ahead with a plan to bring new private casinos to cities like Toronto and push aside horse racing and the people who rely on it. Now, the people of Toronto and people in communities across Ontario, in fact, have said they don't want a casino. And even the Premier has admitted that she doesn't believe that Little Liberals got the horse racing initiative right. What's the government's plan now, Speaker? Premier. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Well, there, there are a number of issues in that question, so I'm going, to, I'm going to talk about what is happening, which is we have been very clear that the integration of horse racing into the gaming plan overall is very important, and in fact, it's part of that five-year plan going forward, Mr. Speaker. We're investing $400 million in the horse racing industry that has introduced stability into the horse racing industry. There is a sustainable future for horse racing in the province, Mr. Speaker, which really was not in place when, uh, when I took this office. So the, the reality of having the integration of horse racing into the overall gaming strategy has happened, Mr. Speaker. That's part of the plan. In terms of uh, municipalities' ability Answer. to choose whether to have a casino or not, Mr. Speaker, that has always been the case, and that will continue to be the case. Yeah. Well, Speaker, here's the reality. The government's plan to push new private casinos isn't working, and it's putting communities that rely on gaming, like Niagara Falls and Fort Erie, for example, at economic risk. risk. The Premier's admitted that the Liberal government didn't get this right. Why is the government upping the ante on a hand that everyone knows is a loser? Well, <laughs> Mr. Speaker, I think what we've done is we have put in place a strategy that is, is going to allow the horse racing industry, the gaming industry, to work together to make sure that this industry overall is able to be responsible and sustainable, Mr. Speaker. There are obviously issues around problem gambling that have to be addressed, Mr. Speaker. There are issues around some communities wanting to have, uh, wanting to have casinos and others not. But that is why it's important that we have an integrated industry, so that horse racing can be part of the overall strategy. It's why, Mr. Speaker, there's a, there's a new board at, uh, at uh, OLG. It's why we've got a new strategy in place to make investments over the next five years and to make sure that the horse racing industry— 
is attached to gaming so that we can make decisions that are rational for communities and for the whole industry. Thank you. Final supplementary. Speaker, the net result of the Premier's OLG privatization scheme is that rural families across Ontario have been thrown into chaos, and regions like Niagara, who have already been hit hard by job loss, feel like they're being clobbered by their own government. The government could have addressed problems in the slots at racetrack program, but instead they chose to put private casinos' interests ahead of tens of thousands of rural families. The Premier isn't holding any aces. And Ontarians are calling her bluff. Will she reinstate the slots at race tax profit sharing program until we can reach a sustainable solution? Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. So let me just let me just get this straight. The leader of the third party wants to reinstate a program that was bad policy, that was not transparent, and was not working for the bulk of the province, Mr. Speaker. That was not providing a sustainable and open process, an open program in horse racing. We, repeated reports looked at that, Mr. Speaker. Uh, back to 2008, there was a report that said this is not a program that is transparent. It is not clear how, uh, how it can work in a way that is fair across the system, Mr. Speaker. So that's the program that the leader of the third party wants to put back in place. Well, we're not going to do that. We're putting in place a program that's going to focus on the customer, that's going to be sustainable, Mr. Mr. Speaker, that's going to provide a future for horse racing, yes, and it's going to be integrated with gaming across the province. That's the plan we've got. Mr. Speaker. You see it, please. You see it, please. Thank you. New question. The member from Halliburton, Kawartha Lakes, Brock. Mr. Speaker, my question is for the Premier. Uh -oh. Back on October 21st of this year, you wrote an open letter on the Ontario.ca website titled, Let's Open Up Government to New Possibilities. In this letter, you state to the Ontario people that I quote, our open government initiative will help create the transparent, accessible government that the people of Ontario deserve. Two weeks ago, I introduced my private member's bill, the Fiscal Transparency and Accountability Amendment Act, pre-election responses, which will put, you in, put into legislation that the government must release a pre-election financial report no later than 30 days after the minister moves the budget motion in the year or within seven days after writ is dropped for a non-fixed election. Question. Premier, I'm doing your work for you. Will you support my bill and let voters know our financial situation? Be seated, please. Thank you, Premier. Mr. Speaker, I commend the member opposite for looking at the legislation that we brought in when we came into office yeah, yeah, yeah. and patterning her private member's bill on that work that we did. I commend her. I have said, Mr. Speaker, that we're very interested in looking at the private member's bill. We're looking. We're interested in hearing the debate, Mr. Speaker. The and member we are from looking for ways to be to order. more open and transparent. So we look forward to the debate. And as I said earlier, unlike the party opposite, we're going to read the legislation and listen to the debate before we make that decision, Mr. Speaker. But we look forward to that debate. Thank you, supplementary. I don't trust you. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Well, um, I did bring in the bill two weeks ago. Uh, you know, you're claiming your government how accountable it is. Uh, this could be a major plus for your government. I'm giving you an opportunity. But let me list your history in transparency. Uh, billion dollar gas plant scandals. Your Ministry of Health is rife with scandals. Orange, e-health. There's two OPP investigations going on. That's your record of transparency. So I'm giving you a chance to support a bill that will provide transparency and tell the people of Ontario the state of the province's finances before they go to the polls. Will you come back on Thursday for private member's bill and support this bill, Question. which will help all of us? Minister, Minister Finance. You see it, please? Premier? Minute. Mr. Speaker, I, can, I appreciate the member opposite's private member's bill and her contribution to this debate. And I can appreciate why you're doing it. Because the Premier of the day in 2003 said this, we are not running a deficit. The Finance Minister of the day said, we are pleased that we have a fifth consecutive balanced budget. And Mr. Speaker, 
Tim Hudak, the member of that minister, uh, uh, I'm sorry, a member of the cabinet, he said this. What did he say? The provincial budget has been balanced. Oh! He said that in October 1, 2003. I appreciate why you don't trust the members on your side of the house. We will do our part. We have introduced a financial accountability officer. We have our statements audited. We are presenting our books in advance, Mr. Speaker, and we'll continue to do so. Thank you. You see it, please. Uh, please. It is uh, order. It's very difficult to ask for order when uh, the answer is being given, and I'm hearing more noise from the side that's giving the answer. And for those that are uh, heckling on the other side, uh, it balances off so that no one can hear. So I'd appreciate uh, a little uh, refrain. New question, the member from Nickel Belt. Merci, Monsieur le Président. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. To the Minister of Health and Long-Term Care. Yesterday, we learned that the tragic death of four Orange employees last May in Moussigny was as a result of organization's failure when it comes to safety and training. This revelation is deeply distressing, especially given the fact that Orange has been under the microscope for, microscope for such a long time, and the government has assured us time and time again that all is good at Orange now. Can the minister explain to Ontarian how things could have gone so wrong yet again? Uh, well, Speaker, uh, there is no question that the uh, terrible tragedy of the helicopter crash on May 31st um, was devastating both personally and for the Orange organization. They have taken action, Speaker. They have uh, uh, responded already to uh, many of the recommendations made by HRSDC. And I know that they are continuing to work with HRSDC to ensure that all of the directions are, in fact, implemented. I think it's fair to say, Speaker, that under the new leadership at Orange, Dr. Andy McCallum and his board and his senior leadership team have put the highest priority on patient safety and on safety of their employees, Speaker. So I think it would be important to note speaker, steps that have already been taken, and I look forward to the supplementary, where I will go over some of those uh, reforms. Speaker. Thank you, supplementary. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Well, too many aspects of what went wrong in Moussigny on May 31st seems like a carried over from the minister's failures to oversee Orange. Months, be months before the crash, a safety officer in Moussigny warned about the risk of green pilots and night flights. But tragically, this whistleblower, like many like him before, seemed to have been ignored. And as a result, four people lost their lives, and three beautiful children in my writings are without their dads. This government can talk a good game about oversight, but if it does not include basic safety standard, it's for none. Will the minister admit that she has yet again failed Ontarians? Uh, speaker, um, in the words of the member from uh, Nickel Belt, um, she has indeed said herself that uh, you give us confidence, speaking to the people at Orange, you give us confidence that strong elements of oversight are now there. You guys are part of this. Your job is to oversee. You know how to do your job. You're dedicated to it. It brings results. Things have changed for the good of the people of Ontario. That was in May, Speaker, and I believe that the member opposite was correct in her observation. So some of the steps that have been taken, Speaker, uh, since May 31st, additional training for helicopter pilots, including controlled flight into terrain. They've, uh, they've revised their operating procedures for night operations, including operations into black hole sites. They're installing yes, solar sir. lighting pads at 91 helipads across the province, including the north, to assist pilots landing at night. Uh, there are other speaker. I will Thank go you. Until, until you. Uh, uh, am I out of time? Sure. Okay. Thank you. Question: The member from Brampton West. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Children and Youth Services. We're all aware of the challenges faced by Crown wards. It can be very difficult growing up in these circumstances. In my community, there are many parents who would like to build families through adoption, 
Ad adoption provides a great way for Crown wards to find permanent loving homes. Unfortunately, the adoption process can be very time-consuming and stressful for families. Minister, can you tell us what our government is doing to make the adoption process easier so more families consider adoption when building a family? Thank you. Minister of Children and Youth Services. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank you to the member from Bam Brampton West for his question. As I said earlier, November is Adoption Awareness Month, and welcome to the Adoption Council of Ontario that are here today. We, of course, want Ontario to be the best place in Canada for families. This includes increasing the number of children growing up in permanent homes through adoption and legal custody. Through reforms and regulatory changes, we have improved the adoption process for families in Ontario. We've removed barriers to adoption and made it easier for prospective parents to adopt a child, provide permanent homes for, for more Crown wards, and prepare youth for adulthood. I would encourage all families looking to adopt to visit the MCYS website. The website provides helpful tips and advice on how to navigate our adoption system. We will continue to Answer. help families who would like to adopt and assist more children join safe, loving, and permanent families. Supplementary. Thank you very much, Minister. I'm glad to see that we've taken action to improve the adoption process in Ontario and that through legislative changes, we're helping families and youth throughout the province. I'm hopeful that families will take advantage of the helpful advice posted on the ministry's website. Speaker, another thing I hear from my community is that many older Crown wards are passed over for adoption. It's important that we help these youth find permanent homes of their own. And it's my understanding that a barrier to their adoption is that the process can be quite costly for prospective families. Minister, what's our government doing to encourage the adoption of older Crown wards? Thank you, Minister. Thank you again for the supplementary. And uh, we recognize as well that there are often challenges to placing older children and siblings in permanent homes. One of the factors that was just raised is uh, costs associated with adoption. That's why we took action to help these youth by making adoption easier for prospective families. Last year, we introduced an adoption subsidy for families who adopt children over the age of 10. The subsidy provides financial support of $11,400 per year per child. The subsidy offers great assistance to families who would like to adopt but face financial barriers. Through this subsidy, 110 children have already found permanent homes, and it's expected that by the end of the year, 150 more children will be adopted. These changes, speakers, improve the lives of children in care and ensure that more yes, children sir. are placed in safe, loving, and permanent homes, and more importantly, families. Exactly. Your, your question, the Leader of the Opposition. Thank you, uh, Speaker. My question is to Premier. Okay. Uh, the answer is then to the uh, Minister of uh, Health. Uh, Minister, uh, I think you agree with me that the people of South Niagara deserve a modern, state-of-the-art hospital. You appointed uh, Kevin Smith uh, to be the supervisor of the Niagara Health System. I don't often agree with all of your decisions, but I think Kevin Smith has done a terrific job. And uh, as you know, he pointed out that a South Niagara hospital, as opposed to maintaining the four existing sites, would save the taxpayer $285 million in capital, and then you'd have a $10 million savings in operating from lower admin expenses that you could put to attracting uh, more nurses and more specialists. I, I think all of us agree that this is the way to go the next step, as you know, Minister, is a planning grant to allow the folks at the Niagara Health System to then decide where the services are going to go and how they're going to build that new hospital. I ask you, Minister, will you green like this? Will you grant them the authority and give them the planning grant to go to the next step for this needed hospital? Thank you. Well, well, Speaker, um, I, I'd like to thank the member opposite for acknowledging the extraordinarily fine work that Dr. Kevin Smith has thank done you. at the Niagara Health System. As, as he well knows, there was a difficult challenge when Dr. Smith was appointed supervisor, but I think there is an overwhelmingly strong consensus that he has done a great job and really put that hospital on a much stronger footing. The member opposite does raise the issue of a, of a capital request for a new hospital in South Niagara. Uh, it is something, Speaker, that uh, uh, we are looking at carefully. It, of course, does come 
with, uh, with the closure of other hospitals. As Dr. Smith said, we would uh, close five hospitals to build one new one. That is not an easy decision Answer. for a community to make, Speaker. I think I'd like some clarity from the member opposite whether he, in fact, would support Thank that you. plan as described by Dr. Smith. Supplementary. I think I've been very clear about that, actually. I said you should carry out Dr. Smith's recommendations and do it, do it now. Uh, this, it, what's not to like about this? It actually saves money. It actually means that you have uh, savings you could put towards attracting new nurse, nurses that run off their feet today. Um, so what's not to like this proposal? It saves taxpayers money and it raises the bar when it comes to standards. I will caution you to ignore the NDP's approach. Initially, they wanted the site to be in Welland, and then there's a by-election, so they said, well, we also want it to be in Niagara Falls, and they said, well, keep them all open. Um, they want to have the cake in it, too. Nobody takes that NDP way seriously. I think Dr. Smith has made the right recommendation. So the question is, the planning grant is the next step. You did authorize that for the well in, sorry, for Windsor in a similar situation where they consolidated Windsor from two sites down to one. Order. So the case is in Niagara. So I don't know why you did it for question. Windsor, but you're not doing it for Niagara. So I'll ask you, will you say yes to the planning grant to allow the work to happen? Thank you. We want to see that new hospital at the Lions Creek Road site Thank you. in Niagara Falls. Why don't you? Yes, well, as speaker, as I say, I am delighted with the conversion of the leader of the opposition to actually believing that investing in capital infrastructure, investing in hospitals is the right thing to do. You will recall, recall uh, just uh, a year ago, Speaker, a year and a bit ago, when our budget included the plans for, uh, for building new hospitals. The Leader of the Opposition voted against that. He voted against building new hospitals, many of them in communities represented by members of his own party. So I'm delighted he's changed his mind. I'm delighted that he sees that capital infrastructure, building in hospital, building hospitals, investing in that infrastructure is the right thing to be doing, Speaker. So we're continuing to build new hospitals. We think it's the right thing to do, Speaker, and we're looking very carefully at this particular project. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, my question is to the minister responsible for the Accessibility for Ontarians Act. Since December of last year, the government has known that 70 per cent of Ontario's private companies are not complying with the AODA reporting requirements. To make matters worse, Speaker, this information was only discovered after the AODA Alliance spent months battling with this government to release this compliance data, information that should always have been publicly available. The minister tells us now that he is quotes unquote upset about the lack of compliance, but can he explain to Ontarians why his government's lack of enforcement had to show up in the Toronto Star for him to finally promise action? Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I appreciate the question. As I, uh, I spoke to this yesterday, I want to repeat that the compliance levels by businesses that have more than 20 employees are required to file by December 31st of last year, and that percentage is unacceptably low. Only 30 per cent of the businesses in this province have complied. So, Since becoming minister, I've taken this issue extremely seriously. During my tenure as minister and minister responsible for the AODA, we have doubled the number of businesses that now are complying. In September, I asked the ministry, and they sent out more than 50,000 letters. 2,500 enforcement letters are going out this week, Mr. Speaker. This is an issue that I take very seriously. Uh, to, uh, to some extent, unfortunately, I have to admit that the AODA legislation itself, as was passed unanimously by this legislature, the mechanism for enforcement is, in some respects, cumbersome in terms of the process that we have to follow. Answer. And, and for that reason, we are following the process as outlined in the law, but I am working on this vigorously, and I, I, I intend to go f as full as we need to get full compliance. Thank you. Supplementary. Speaker, this 2005 legislation is an essential tool for ensuring equal access for persons with disabilities in Ontario, but it can only be effective if the standards are enforced, which is up to this government. Even more outrageous, the government earmarked $24 million to enforce the Act, but they never bothered to spend any of it. Instead of platitudes and empty promises, can the minister prov 
provide Ontarians with a concrete timeline, actually what you're going to do for enforcing the AODA. Finally. Thank you. Minister. Well, you know, I think it's important. To, there are two issues that I want to reference. First of all, we didn't have an opportunity to enforce on the customer service standard until this year. So the requirement for businesses to comply was December the 31st. So since that time, since the beginning of this year, we have sent out two letters to all the businesses across this province, 50, more than 50,000 in September alone. I'm following up with 2,500 enforcement letters. And with regards to, and we also have a marketing plan that we're launching as well. And I want to say, because this is important, on the positive side as well, many businesses have complied, but the entire Ontario Public Service and the, the agencies that this government is responsible for we have 100% compliance for this act as well and for this standard. So we are working on this Answer. vigorously, and I'm prepared, if necessary, to issue further enforcement letters, including fines, until businesses comply. Thank you. Question is member from Etobicoke North. Thank you, uh, Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Training, Colleges and Universities, the Honourable Brad Duguid. Speaker, as the MPP for Etobicoke North, I have many college-age students who attend, of course, various institutions, many of whom are seeking quality training in French. I've also noticed that many Francophone students travel far and wide for the great opportunities available at GTA colleges. When choosing an area for higher study, Francophone students across the province deserve fair and equitable ac access to quality post-secondary education. Such students should be able to choose to study in their area of interest and rest assured that they will have options. Yet, Speaker, unfortunately, still to this day, they are often limited in those very choices. Speaker, can the minister please tell the House what the government is doing to create more opportunities for post-secondary students wishing to study in French? Thank you. Minister of Training, Colleges, Universities. Merci beaucoup pour votre question. Thank you very much for your question. Students have better access to French language programs is a key priority for our government. On October 24th, Mr. Speaker, our government announced an action plan to increase access to French language post-secondary education, particularly services in central and southwestern Ontario. We'll be committing $16.5 million to help universities and colleges expand their French language programs, including expansions that are already underway at York University's Glendon College, Collège Boreal, and La Cité Collégiale. We've also expanded uh, distance grants for students. But, Mr. Speaker, I'd like to take a moment and acknowledge the work of our Minister of Francophone Affairs. Her, she's been a passionate champion for our Francophone community and post-secondary issues. Answer. Speaker, I've had the honour of being able to announce these initiatives, but it's the Minister of Francophone Affairs who's really championed them within our government. She's the one that des deserves the credit. Thank you. Merci, Monsieur le Président. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I'm very happy that the government is going to have post-secondary education in French more accessible. So the post-secondary uh, students in my constituency says that uh, the, amount, the amounts given will allow them to have more programs in French, in law, commerce, public relations, journalism, and biology, to name a few. Mr. Speaker, the minister, could he tell us what this plan is going to mean for the Francophone community in Ontario? Mr. Francophone Affairs, Mr. Speaker. Le ministre. Merci, uh, Monsieur le Président. Mer Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you for the the minister. Thank you for the member of uh, Etobicoke North. And this plan is very important. Since uh, before 2020, there are Francophones going to live in South and Central Ontario. So we are going to increase programs with a um, several million dollars increase. We are going to create a legislative committee that's going to start in the next few months before uh, spring 2014 and we are going to see if Glendon can play a more important role. And we're also discussing with York University to talk about the governments in college. And York University will ask to be designated uh, under the law on Francophone Affairs. Speaker, good morning. Uh, my question is to the acting premier. Uh, last week, in an unprecedented event, the elite anti-racket squad of the OPP 
I took an after-hours tour of the Premier's office. It was described as a crime scene because some in this government destroyed documents so no one would find out about the $1.1 billion scandal. We've asked for a debate and a vote on a non-confidence motion, and we have asked for a judicial inquiry into this $1.1 billion scandal. The Liberal government has refused on both occasions. Would the acting Premier please explain to this House why she thinks the Premier can maintain the confidence of the people of Ontario now that the OPP have directly been engaged in her office? Thank you. Deputy Premier. Um, well, Speaker, I, I think that our Premier has done an extraordinary here, here. job in being open and transparent. From the moment she became Premier of this province, Speaker, she indicated that she would be open, she would be transparent, she would uh, uh, continue to cooperate fully in any effort to gather information. She wrote to the Auditor General, she uh, restruck the committee, she provided 186,000 pages, including 30,000 from the Premier's office. The committee heard from 70 witnesses during 100, more than 100 hours. All documents uh, were, uh, were released. The opposition voted against that, strangely enough. Uh, the, uh, the Premier appeared at the committee in April. She's coming back Answer. on December the 3rd. She's accepted responsibility as a member of cabinet. Speaker, I think our premier has done everything possible to make sure people get the information Thank they need. Supplementary. Thank you. Back to the acting premier. Does this sound transparent to you? Your government broke the law. Your government told this House on several occasions the cancellation was only $40 million, when instead you knew for as many as two years it was over $700 million. You obstructed the Information and Privacy Commissioner, and they destroyed official government documents. Speaker, at what point does that government not go to the people to seek a mandate because they have lost the trust of the people of Ontario? Will you call an election and seek a mandate? Thank you. Deputy Premier. A government house leader, Speaker. Government house leader. Oh, no. oh, oh, oh. Mr. Speaker, the member. said no. First of all, the member should be very, very careful. I think with with her language. But you know, Mr. Speaker, there's there's a broader issue here, and that is that she can't ignore the fact as she tries to day after day that it was the Progressive Conservative Party, Mr. Speaker, that went from door to door in right. those ridings involved with the gas plan and said the only way to see them cancelled was to vote for the Progressive Conservatives. It was the leader of her party who stood up at a press conference, which is available on YouTube, and said that if he was elected Premier, that the gas plant would be done, done, done. Mr. Speaker, it was their party that went into the last election promising through robocalls through press releases, through tweets, through door-to-door -door yes, pamphlets, that the only way to get rid of the gas plants was to have them form the government. It's time they came clean with their analysis, with their costing, Thank and you. their campaign. Thank you. New question. The member from uh, London West. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Minister of Community Safety and Correctional Services. Speaker, earlier this month, we learned of the death of Adam Cargis at the Elgin Middlesex Detention Centre after he was housed with another inmate with a long history of violence. In addition to specific issues of overcrowding and lack of direct supervision at EMDC, this tragedy also shows the ineffectiveness of the province-wide offender tracking information system in letting correctional officers know about inmates with previous records of assaults or gang activity. When is the government going to take real action to ensure officer and inmate safety across all of Ontario's correctional facilities? Minister of Community Safety and Corrections. For, for the question. I think it's a very uh, important question. As you know, Mr. Speaker, the safety of both the inmates and the correctional officer is my number one priority. We focus strongly on communication between our correctional facility and the justice system. We have a centralized database of under tracking and formation system. Inmates' demeanor and threat level are on 
OTIS, this uh, information system. Access by administrator, by facility uh, transfer. We have procedures, standing order for sharing inmate information. Correctional officers are trained for this. Information is shared with staff, including criminal and behavior uh, history. Information is shared also with staff, uh, verbally, Answer. writing, and electronically. Correctional officers uh, expected to familiarize themselves with inmates' uh, situation and share any update during shift change. Thank you. Merci, Thank you. Mr. Speaker. Supplementary. Uh, thank you, Speaker. Again, to the Minister of Community Safety and Correctional Services. Speaker, I think it would be helpful for the Minister to actually talk to correctional officers herself. They know that a provincial database is only as good as the information it contains and how widely it is shared. There has been no auditing of the database to ensure accuracy. There are no processes in place to provide consistent access across institutions. And despite what the ministry claims, there are no mechanisms for staff to raise concerns. When will the minister accept her responsibility for oversight and put systems in place to make sure that the offender tracking information system is doing what it is supposed to do? Thank you, Minister. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, for the, for the, the question. Uh, as I said, you know, health and safety of the, uh, both the uh, correctional officer and the inmate are my number one uh, priority. Mr. Speaker, this system, the OTIS uh, information system, is constantly reviewed. The, uh, that review is part of our continuous improvement uh, process. The process includes a weekly report of employee concern related to the system, so we are taking the complaint and we are addressing the complaint. OTIS was audited this past year from a, a technological perspective, and the probation and parole officer, as well as approved designated staff who have a business reason to access the offender's record can use Answer. a centralized database for this purpose. So, Mr. Speaker, we take it very seriously. It's continuously reviewed, and if the correctional officer have concern about it, Thank I uh, advise them to bring the concern to the management. Thank, Thank you. you. Yeah. New question, the member from Thunder Bay, Adam Kirkham. Thank you, Speaker. Speaker, my question is for the, uh, the Minister of Energy. And Minister, in 2003, all three political parties and all three political leaders committed to closing all coal-fired energy in Ontario and two of the five plants producing energy that way were in my riding of Thunder Bay, Atacokan. For 10 years, I've been working on the conversion, the maintenance, and the sustainability of both of the coal plants in my riding, including the plant in Atacokan, and that conversion, I'm pleased to say, is well under the way, underway. Over the next decade, there's the potential for a number of mining projects to come on stream in northwestern Ontario. And while there continues to be disagreement over the energy needs of northwestern Ontario in the next five to ten years, we need to ensure that Thunder Bay and northwestern Ontario are positioned for the economic growth and job creation these projects may bring. Speaker, last Friday I was pleased to announce, along with my colleague from Thunder Bay Superior North, that the Thunder Bay Generating Station will be converted to burn advanced biomass fuel. Question. Minister, for the benefit of the House, could you please share some of the work that went into ensuring the future of the Thunder Bay Generating Station? Thank you. Minister of Energy. Speaker, I thank the member from Thunder Bay, Atacokan, for his question. And the member and his colleague, the Minister of Northern Development of Mines, I've been adv advocating on this issue for many years, unlike the third party who only seemed to have discovered it yesterday. And I want to commend them for their work on this file. Friday's announcement was the result of the member's strong leadership over the past 10 years, as well as that of his colleague from Thunder Bay, and months of working with the local stakeholders and residents and Ontario's energy agencies. The conversion to advanced biomass is another step in reducing dirty coal burning in Ontario and puts our province on the leading edge of worldwide biomass research. And the continued operation of this plant will ensure that Thunder Bay has the power it needs to support future economic Answer. expansion. Supplementary. Thank you, Speaker. Ms. Minister, thank you for, uh, for the response. But having worked on this issue for 10 years, I know how important Friday's announcement was for the constituents in my riding and for the future of Northwestern Ontario. 
Not only will this cost-effective conversion to advanced biomass ensure that Thunder Bay has the supply of clean and reliable electricity it needs, it will secure significant employment until at least 2020. With the Thunder Bay and Atacogan generating station conversions now in place, I feel we're well positioned to move forward and prepared for the mining expansion that may come in the Northwest. The five-year contract will allow us to monitor the region's energy demands over the near term and make the appropriate decision at that time. Can the minister please update the House on what other steps our government has taken to ensure Northwestern Ontario has a supply of clean, reliable Question. and affordable electricity? Thank you. Minister of Energy. Mr. Speaker, the Chair uh, Ian Angus of the Northwest uh, Energy Task Force uh, states, and I quote, five years is really good. A commitment to keep this plant alive is really good. Mr. Speaker, we expect the converted unit will begin operating in 2015 on a five-year contract helping ensure the residents of Thunder Bay continue to have a clean, reliable, cost-effective supply of electricity. Great news. To ensure the region has the energy it needs for new mining projects, we have also committed to building a new transmission line between Wawa and Thunder Bay, which will provide an additional 650 megawatts of capacity wow. for the Northwest. And the North of Dryden report lays out additional options for new generation and transmission lines over the short and long term, including the connection of remote communities in the region. Mr. Speaker, our government has taken action Answer. to ensure that Northwestern Ontario has the energy they need when they need it and will continue to work to ensure the capacity is there for mining developments in the future. New question, the member from Newmarket, Aurora. Thank you, Speaker. To, uh, to the Minister of Speaker, uh, the minister has been boasting about a new management team at Orange since January of 2012. One would have expected that a competent and experienced management team would have at least ensured that the, the Minister of the Environment come to order. federal safety regulations would be met by that organization. But we find this week that a Human Resources Canada report cited that Orange failed to comply in six specific areas, including failing to adequately train pilots on the hazards associated with operating helicopters in Northern Ontario, especially when flying for nighttime emergencies. Speaker, this Question. is under the current management team. I want to know from the minister, how much more evidence does she need to conclude that Orange does not have the core competency to manage an aviation business, and will she agree to transfer that to the private sector? Thank you. Thank you. Minister of Health, Long Term Care. Uh, speaker, um, interesting to hear the recommendation from the member opposite. No, we will not be transferring Orange to a private sector operator, Speaker. The uh, improvements have, at Orange have been significant and tangible and real, and they have been working with HRSDC to ensure that they fully comply with the directions made by HRSDC. Speaker. They have already moved on a number of fronts. I will go over them again. Additional training for helicopter pilots, including control flight into terrain. The revised, op uh, revised operating procedures for night operations, including operations into Black Hole sites. Answer. They're installing solar lighting pads at 91 helipads, including in the north, to assist pilots landing at night. Speaker, they're auditing all training. Thank you. Thank you. Supplementary. Speaker, how much longer will this minister put pilots and paramedics and patients at risk? It is very clear. Not only the HRDC report, but there were two Transport Canada reports issued earlier this year that show non-compliance in a number of areas, specifically with regard to pilot training, training pilots on simulators in a model that is different from the model they're being asked to fly, not training pilots in terms of de-icing, fundamental issues that any company with the experience and competency in aviation would know. It shouldn't take a report to point out the shortcomings of the management at Orange. This minister, intent on keeping the MAZA scheme in place, continues to put pilots and paramedics and patients at risk. When will Question. she agree to finally 
settle on making the important changes there rather than perpetuating a MAZA scheme? That's my question. Thank you. Will she take the necessary leadership? Sure. Will she do that? Be seated, please. Be seated, please. Thank you. Minister of Health, Long Term Care. Uh, speaker, if the member opposite actually um, uh, would take off his ideological blinkers and look at what's actually happening, he would see that that change is well underway. Speaker, I'm going to continue with some of the changes that have been made uh, uh, since May 31st. Speaker, they're, they're hiring flight operations quality assurance inspectors and a manager of flight training and standards. They're auditing all training records to identify and address any training needs for staff. They're ensuring that all helicopters have advanced avionics in their fleet. Speaker. These steps that are being taken uh, will, will continue to improve the quality of care. But the people at Orange are doing excellent work, Speaker. Answer. Just yesterday, they transfer, transferred 32 patients. Four little children got to the health care they needed, thanks to the good work of the people at Orange. Speaker. Thank you. New question. Member from Kamara Rainy River. Thank you to the Minister of Transportation. Last weekend, much later than usual, the Northwest finally received its first dump of snow, and the contractors should have been prepared. Despite MTO assurances that the ministry has increased contractors' budgets by 16 per cent and that will put new equipment on the roads, conditions were as bad as ever in the Northwest. Highways closed, accidents increased, and the region came to a standstill. Even the public school board's bus cancellation notice conceded very little clearing had occurred. When will the minister get serious about the safety in northwestern Ontario and ensure that northerners can travel safely on the highways of all seasons? Thank you, Mr. Transportation Infrastructure. Uh, Mr. Speaker, we have added 50 crews and vehicles in northeastern and northwestern Ontario alone. There are six additional crews on duty now uh, in the Kenora Rainy River area. There's more vehicles than ever before. Uh, there is also a program, Mr. Speaker, where we are requiring all contractors to replace all of their ve vehicles over 10 years at, at at least 10 per cent per year. That's well underway. It does snow. There are icy conditions that come up quickly. The other thing that's been added, Mr. Speaker, and in Kenora this is a particular challenge, uh, is that we do pre-treat the bridges for icing, which is the biggest risk. Mr. Speaker, we have the safest roads in North America, including the North, and giving our weather challenges is rather huge. I will look at the particular issues uh, in your constituency, and if there isn't a response, I'll assure there is one, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. Supplementary. Thank you, Speaker. Um, you know, that, that all sounds fine and dandy, but I mean, the bottom line is that you've reduced these contracts by $22 million. Uh, the NDP has been forced to compile road reports for the past two years just to prove to your ministry that a problem exists. I'm hearing things. Last Yesterday, my office was flooded. I've heard that there's no proactive work being done on roads, that the salt doesn't go down when they know that there's going to be an issue. Last year was the worst uh, he year that we've had in history. We're th having things like 14 transport pileups. Wow. Some highways aren't safe to travel for a week after there's very little snow. We can't continue Question. to shut down the entire region whenever there's a snowfall, and your assurances are not working. Will you act now to ensure that highways in northwestern Ontario are maintained all year long? Uh, Thank you. Minister? Uh, uh, Mr. Speaker, uh, the, the, the challenge isn't just snow. I was in Sudbury earlier this week with the MPP from Sudbury, and it was a perfectly bone-dry day, and we had accidents because cars flipped over. No snow, nothing visible, people didn't perceive it, but we had icing on the bridges, Mr. Speaker. And when we have bad snow, it's a problem. It's a particular problem in the north because we don't have enough alternate routes, which is why this government, unlike others past, with no help from the federal government, is twitting those highways. Answer. I do not run the contract, but they have more equipment than they ever have before. I've been up with the MPP from Al Algoma, Manitoulin. I will come to your constituency. I will meet with the contractor with you, and we'll make sure you get satisfaction. Thank, Thank you, Mr. You. Speaker. Member from Simcoe Gray on a point of order. Yes, uh, Mr. Speaker, I seek unanimous consent to move a motion that the order of the House dated November 4, 2013, referring Bill 105, an act to amend the Employer Health Tax Act, to the Standing Committee on General Government be discharged. 
and the, that Bill 105 be referred instead to the Standing Committee on Finance and Economic Affairs. Thank you. Thank you. You, unanimous consent. The member has asked for unanimous consent. Do we agree? Yeah. I heard a no. Thank you. The member from the member from Timmins, James Bay, on a point of order. Mr. Speaker, I uh, would just say in regards to this particular request that's been put forward by the Honourable House Leader of the Opposition, the official opposition, there's been no discussion about the House Leader, the, amongst the House Leaders at this point, to deal with this. Nobody, one second, Speaker, one second. None of the, none of the parties are opposed to 105. There's a way of moving. I understand. Order, please. Order, please. As is the convention, that is not the place for me as the speaker. That's not a point of order, and I know that you've put it on record, but that's not my my responsibility. And I would I would offer all members uh, to the house leaders together to have that discussion. There are no deferred votes. This house stands adjourned until sorry until 3 p.m. this afternoon.